Alrighty, so uh, this morning uh, we're going to begin a short series of uh, class uh, on, uh, on the Incarnation. Um, I was asked by Hugh if, if I could teach a, a few classes, um, something that would, that would bounce off of the season of Christmas. And I thought, well, you know, yeah, I can. Um, I thought maybe we could go kind of uh, deep into a uh, study of theology of what the Incarnation means and what people have said about that. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, you need to next week bring your, your pillows and eye masks um, because, you know, hopefully I'm getting. Uh, I love this stuff. Um, my uh, One of my classes that I taught once... There was a change in curriculum after I was at Lubbock Christian for, for two years, and we added this class, and it was called Christian Heritage. It was a uh, study of church history, 2,000 years in a single semester. Um, and it was, yeah, well, we didn't go real deep, as you can imagine. Um, but it was, a, it was a historical theology class. And... Uh, it was one of those that I, I love teaching because when you teach, you learn more than you can possibly give. And my grasp on historical theology before that was not vacuous. It wasn't completely empty. But I came out of that experience of teaching that class for three years with a far firmer grasp on how things unfolded. And uh, this, this class, I'd like to share with you uh, two of my favorite moments in, from that class over these next four class periods. Um, the first thing I want to do is spend just a moment talking about uh, theology and what that is. Theology, uh, the word theology is the study of God. Ology, you may have run into a lot of times. You know, psychology, uh, throw me another ology. Uh, biology, what's, what's biology? And why is it biology? What, ology is the study of... Yeah, Bios's life. Yeah, so biology. Well, uh, you all know the word theo, right? Or theos. Uh, theos is the Greek for God. Uh, theology, therefore, is the study of God. And what theologians do, there are two big approaches to theology. We're pretty familiar with one of them, and churches of Christ are fairly unfamiliar with the other. Uh, the first is systematic theology. I brought a couple of systematic theology tomes just to be kind of a visual because I don't have a PowerPoint. This is a, a systematic theology. It is longer than the Bible, <laughs> considerably. Uh, this is longer than that. <laughs> it's actually called systematic theology. The way that a systematic theology works is that you go, you, you, you say, okay, I want to study a theme. I want to look, look at a, the theology of the person of God, or the Trinity, or atonement. Okay, I want to look at that theme, and what they then do is they go through the scriptures with a fine-tooth comb, looking for things that will relate to that theme. And so it is, it is a very biblical approach. The reason it's called systematic is that you're building a system, right? You're building a, a set of beliefs and understandings that are, um, that are then, you, then what you use is that becomes kind of your matrix and grid by which you'll read the Bible. It kind of sits in the background of your mind. You've built this big thought program from the Bible, and then you also take it to the Bible as you're studying and reading. That's systematic theology. And that, that sounds familiar, right? Right? I mean, that's what we do all the time. Uh, the Church of, Churches of Christ expects every member to kind of be a systematic theologian. That's why we encourage you to read your Bibles. That's why we encourage you to think for yourself. You know, we want you to dig into those scriptures and find what they mean. You know, and, and look through. We are good at this. We are back to the book Christians. You know, you ever hear the phrase back to the Bible? Our origins are in the Americas, you know, that, that we as a movement kind of get rolling in America. And one of the American impulses is the skipping over of all intervening history to get back to a pure point of origin. 
That's just an American impulse. And you think about the psyche of what happened to Americans when they discover the new world. They've left settled Europe. Have anybody here been to Europe? What's it like in those old towns? You know, most of them have an inner city. Tell me about what you see on the buildings. Established when? 18, 14s, 15s, 11s. 800s, you know, you see these blocks that have got a year of our Lord, 1138 or something like that in Geneva, you know, in the inner, the old city of Geneva, the streets are tiny, you can't drive a, the reason European cars look like they, you know, are a matchbox that you added water to and it got a little bigger, you know, is because the streets are really made for mules, not cars, you know, and they're, they're tiny. They left that behind and they came here where, what was here? Space, trees, Native Americans. Tell me about the Native American cities. They were portable, right? They didn't, they didn't build cities here. So they came basically, and the, the American psyche experienced this Edenic experience. It's like we had jumped back in time to a purer world. Does that sound at all like us? Jumping back to 33 AD, skipping over all intervening history. Now, because of that, uh, you know, obviously intervening history had happened. But in the Americas, we looked at, at all of these denominations out here with all of their creeds. And what a creed, what a creed is for is it's supposed to be a way to read the scriptures. That's what a creed is for. It gives you a basic set of beliefs that you then take the scriptures. You know, and the early creeds were short. You know, you could recite it in two and a half minutes. That was the early creeds. But by the time we get to the Americas, you have creeds that are books that again are longer than the Bible. You know, and what they're being used for is not just to kind of give us a, a, a safe understanding of scripture so that we can read it together. They were being used very much as fellowship tools to say, you believe all of this or you're out. And we in the Americas said, I just want to be a Christian. Can we just be Christians? And so we said, our big theme was no creed but the Bible. Right? One of our very first documents is the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery which basically says we will that this body die and sink back into Christendom. We want to be Christians only. We want to be like the first century Christians, as if no one had ever thought that before. You know, so what, what that did to us, though, and one of the things that it kind of took away from us is historical theology. If you want to do what they were saying you want to do, then what you have to know about is what? Well, the first hundred years, maybe. That's where the authoritative stuff is. And it's important you realize all Christians thought that when we were doing that. Everyone was saying the authoritative stuff's there. But there's also an authority that's, that's happened as, as time has gone on to help us understand that. And so there's a second kind of authority in church history. And we basically said, no, there's not. Church history doesn't have anything to say to us. And what that did was it kind of stripped us of the ability or the desire to do historical theology, which is the other way theology is approached. Like I said, this, this is systematic theology. Okay? where you go through the scriptures and you look at the scriptures and say, what does the scripture teach me about this theme? So I want to know about the atonement. I'm going to look for anywhere where any atonement is being done. So I'll explore Leviticus and all the sacrifices and, and then eventually I'll come to the cross and I'll say, how does the cross fit into this? How is it similar? How is it different? And that's systematic theology. Now, when you become a historical theologian, it is not as though you leave scripture behind uh, because historical theologians are going to but you do kind of take a step away from scripture in a sense 
Because what historical theologians are going to do is ask, how did this theme develop through history? How do we come to believe this? For instance, how many of us here, well, I don't want to see a show of hands, but I'll go ahead and ask the question. How many of us here are Trinitarian in our thinking? Well, that's most of us, right? You know, I mean, there may be a few of us that, are, that have not really thought about it or a few of us that are modalists or something, but for the most part, in Churches of Christ, we are very Trinitarian. Have you ever asked yourself why? Why, are you, why do you believe in a Trinity? Well, I'm sorry? <sighs> now, Don, you're, you're, you're jumping way ahead because that's my, the conclusion I'm pushing for, but I didn't want it yet. I <laughs> that's correct. Okay, yes, that would be the big answer. The Bible says so. Absolutely. And I would say yes. That is correct. However, do you know that that has not always been understood? You couldn't, the way that, that historical theology develops is generally in response to heresy. We determine what we do believe because something will come up, something will raise its head that we do not believe eventually. But when it first comes to the scene, it makes sense. Generally, heresy is easier than orthodoxy. Heresy is generally more straightforward because orthodoxy is very, very complicated. Understand, explain the Trinity to a seven-year-old. <laughs> I mean, that's a hard one. Christian math is 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. How did, on earth does that, what? Well, it's like these three people. You got Peter, you got Paul, you got Mary. <laughs> Rock group there, you know. <laughs> Not Mary, the mother of Jesus. But you got Peter, Paul, and Andrew, and yet somehow they're one person. Oh, I get it. And you end up with these analogies of egg. You know, you've got an egg, and it's got a shell, and it's got a white, and it's got a yolk. Yeah, but those are all distinct things. And somehow in the Trinity, every bit of God is the Father. Yeah, well, I've heard that one too. Steam, uh, steam liquid, and ice. The problem with that is that's modalism, because it's the same water, and it's just changing modes. But modalism would have Jesus be the Father. Jesus is the Father. And I want to say, well, who on earth is he talking to? And when the Father speaks at his baptism, is he throwing his voice? And what on earth is going on with the dove coming down? He's already there in the water. What is that? Well, the thing is, all analogies will eventually break down because all of God is the Father and all of God is the Son, and all of God is the Spirit. The entirety of God is each of them, and yet they are all distinct persons. <laughs> what, a, what a historical theologian does, and I brought you these so that you could see that there are actually also books written from a historical theological perspective. These are called a history of Christian thought, and they, they do theolo theology. They will come to a controversy, and there's your theme, and they'll spend time saying, okay, here's what was taught about this, and here's what the argument was, here's who the players were, and here's why this was a big deal, and here's how it kind of worked out. You know, and this has to be written in three volumes because it's so bad. Uh The other thing that you'll do is you'll get primary source documents, and that's what this is. Uh, primary source documents are the things written by the people who are actually there. So uh, in the Trinitarian controversy, you had a guy named Arius who was our bad guy. Well, this has got letters written by Arius to his supporters. It's also our hero is a guy named Alexander. And uh, he wasn't that great. He's not the great. He was 
sorry. Uh, but Alexander also has written things called encyclials, which is letters that are expected to be read in a great, full, huge area. Um, it, this will include also the, uh, the Nicene Creed, uh, the creed that it was eventually produced to kind of rebuke Arius. Okay? So a historical theologian will look at this kind of stuff. And this is dull as paint, but I, I have to admit that I find this weirdly fascinating. I'm a strange guy that way. Um, what I would like to do in this class is do a little bit of work in uh, historical theology that relates to the incarnation and spend a little bit of time talking about how it is that the church came to believe these things that we have in many ways just inherited. That we don't realize these things were hard fought for and had to be hammered out. The fact that you're Trinitarian is because the church figured it out over time. It is worth realizing that in the 200s and early 300s, most people did not realize the Trinity was a very big deal. And many people did not know what to make of it and did not care. Okay? That, that something that seems like a really big deal to us, they didn't really care all that much about. So how did this all happen? Well, I'll have to tell you a story. Uh, you're familiar with the first couple hundred years of Christianity. What was going on? How did, how did things with the empire, how did it sit? Not well? Turmoil? Why, why? Persecution, absolutely. What was, the, what was the kind of state religion of the Roman Empire? Hmm. Emperor worship? Absolutely. What else? Polytheism. That's absolutely right. They worshipped um, Jupiter and Diana and etc. Okay? So, during the... I'm sorry? Yeah, etc. was the god of a whole lot of things. <laughs> you did. And then I, I doubled down. And I feel shame. What's that? Yes, that's right. So, uh, but you rem you'll recall that... Or, or you. I don't say you recall. You probably know that eventually you had a guy named Constantine, right? And what did Constantine do? That's right. He kind of brought Christianity out of the shadows of oppression and into... Now, first, there were four emperors. There was a guy named Galerius, Constantine, and then two other people that are not all that important because they were kind of juniors. And they had divided the empire into two parts because it was kind of unwieldy. Things were not going as smoothly as they had in the first century. Galerius hated Christianity, did a huge, huge persecution of Christianity um, across the whole empire. And then he got deathly ill. I mean, super sick, like he's on his deathbed. And some Christian, uh, some Christian leaders went to him and said, this is a judgment of God because you're hurting us. You need to stop. And Galerius, a man grasping at a straw, says, all right, I'm sorry. You know, I, I shouldn't have done it. And what you end up with is something called the Edict of Toleration. And that's uh, around 312, I want to say, but I'm not positive. Don't quote me on that. But anyway, you have this edict. It might have been 306, somewhere in there. And the Edict of Toleration basically made Christianity a religion that's on par with paganism. It, it made it so that it wouldn't be persecuted anymore. Well, then Galerius died anyway, you know, because I mean, he really had done some very awful stuff. And Constantine now decides, okay, time to move against the junior emperor and reunify the empire. You know, this is all weekend. I'm going to go get that. So Constantine goes, and while he's going, he has a vision in the sky. Have you heard of this? It is, he sees this vision of a Cairo, which are the first two letters in the word Christ. It's a, have you ever seen a Cairo? It's this neat thing that, that kind of has a long, look, looks like a P with an X in it. So he has this vision in the sky and a, and, a, and a phrase in the sky that says, conquer under this. So he has that painted on all his shields, and he says, if, if 
I win the day, that'll be my God. He'll be my God. Well, he won. He won the battle, he reunites the empire, and Constantine doesn't convert to Christianity. Uh, but he does make Christianity the empire's religion. Constantine waited to do his conversion stuff until right at his death. And the reason for that is he knew that he'd have to kill a lot of people. And he, you know, he's like, I will still have to be a world emperor, and I know what your Christ says, and I can't do that yet. But, and in his deathbed, he, which gave the empire a real nice, uh, that gave the Christians in the empire a real nice thing. They had a very friendly emperor, but at the same time, he could kill their enemies, and they didn't have to worry about it. Uh, he did. In fact, he built an entire city uh, called Constantinople. Yeah? It's now Istanbul. It's not Constantinople. Istanbul. There's this song. Anyway, uh, it, yeah, they might be giants. Uh, so at, now what Constantine now wanted is he wanted the Christians to kind of get along. It was very necessary for them to do that. Christ, people who had never been Christians kind of come flowing into Christianity kind of watering down Christianity in a lot of ways. It was in this setting that you have the big heretical controversy that led to us once and for all kind of figuring out God is Trinity. There was a guy named Alexander, and he was, uh, he was a bishop. He was one of the teachers of a church. And he got up and he did a uh, sermon on the Trinity. And he talked for a long time explaining the Trinity in very detailed terms. It was, uh, I wish honestly that we had a copy of that sermon. I think it would be very useful to look at and say, what was he saying and how is it different from what eventually got figured out? But at any rate, even the people who heard it thought, well, he's gone too far. You know, even his supporters were like, ah, you made much of that. I'm not sure that that's all there. A guy named Arius was a presbyter under... The, uh, under Alexander's leadership, which means that he's a preacher, but he's not all the way to a bishop. He doesn't have that kind of authority, but he's a preacher. And he got up and responded to Alexander by saying, no, 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 you've got this all wrong. Christ is a created thing. The Word of God came into being, and there was when he was not. Now, he doesn't say there was a time when he was not because Arius knew that Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. Okay? But he was born. He came into existence. There was, before time and before creation, a beginning to Jesus. Now, the reason that mattered eventually, there, you know, at first folks didn't know what was on the line there. But the thing that came to be on the line, two things. One, we had been worshiping differently than that for about 300 years. We'd been using Trinitarian formulas in our worship. But the other was that if Christ is created, then Christ is mutable or passable. What that means is that he is subject to change. God, it was understood, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is always the same. He does not change. But everything that God created, in fact, part of the nature of creation is its changeability. We change all the time. I changed my underwear today. You know, we... <clears throat> you're welcome. We... Was it? I might have... Anyway, uh, we get up every day a little bit different than we laid down. You know, for one thing, we're a little older. And for another, you know, you're, you have different experiences, and different experiences causes you to have different outlooks. You have emotions, and your emotions change throughout the day, don't they? So you are changeable. God is not. God does not change. That was their big thing. Well, does Christ change or not? Well, if he's a created being, then he's passable, he's changeable. And he is our Savior. There is no bigger change, is there, than going from non-existence to existence. That's a fairly significant change. If you can change like that, who's to say that you can't change from good to bad? 
And where is our salvation found? In Christ. In union with Christ. Baptism unites us with Christ Jesus. So if He is changeable, and he, if He is changeable, then He will change. That's the nature of the argument. If He's changeable, the thing that you can count on with changeable things is that they change. And what if He changes from good to wicked? Then all who are united with Him, instead of being saved, are damned. Now that was what they eventually realized was on the line. But you can't say, well, why didn't they just look at the Scriptures? Because they were looking at the Scriptures. In fact, if you want to open your Bibles, someone read for me Psalm 8, verse 20, or not Psalm, Proverbs. Proverbs 8, verse 22. Okay, so the Lord brought me forth as the first of His works. And if you go on and you read the rest of, of that big chunk of Scripture there, I think it's about 12 verses, it's clear that the one being spoken of is the agent of creation. Who is the agent of creation? Jesus. The Word is the agent of creation. Right? Right? You know that by reading John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing has been made that has been made. Okay? So we know that that's about Jesus. That, Psalm, that Proverbs verse is about Jesus. And it clearly says that there's a beginning point, right? He says the first of the works, which means that there's a time when God's not working and then there's a time that He is working. Doesn't it? Arius makes that argument. Seems very obvious to him. Remember, heresy is always easier. Heresy is always simple. It's straightforward. It says what it means, means what it says. And so Arius will look at that and he'll say, duh. There was when God was not working, and then he began to work. And Jesus is the first of his works. And you can't argue that he didn't do that because he created, didn't he? Creation's not eternal. So he brought creation into existence, so he, there was a time when he wasn't a creator, and then he was. So that's not a change in God. That's a choice to do something. But he didn't change. And to begin working is not a change. So he began working, and his first work was to create Jesus. Pretty straightforward, right? And especially when you read from the Greek in uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, the Word was with God and the Word was God, except there's no definite article. And Greek has no indefinite article. It doesn't have an indefinite article. It, and the way that Greek uses the definite article, the, a definite article is the word the, an indefinite article is the word a. Okay? Greek doesn't have the word a. It just doesn't do that. And if you put the, it's not always translated. You know, because the God will just be God. But it, the definite article there is to let you know that I'm talking about the actual God. Right? So you wouldn't translate that into English. But the lack of, a, of the definite article and the, and the lack of an indefinite article in existence can mean that you translated the word was with God and the word was a God. You ever hear that before? No, who's we yeah, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach this. The Jehovah's Witnesses are Arians. This is why historical theology matters. Because we will repeat the same mistakes if we don't look back and see what they hammered out. And that's in the Americas, all of the classical heresies revived. All of them. We brought back Montanus, we brought back Arius, we brought back Nestorius, we brought back all of these things in, into America because we went, ah, history doesn't matter. Oops. The other thing, the other scriptures that he looked at were John 3.16. Some of us may know that one. Who is Jesus in John 3.16? What kind of son? Only 
begotten. What is begetting? Yep, begotten, not made. That's in the. That's absolutely in the creed. That's right. What is begotten? What is to beget? It's an old English word. None of us know. Yes, it's it's got to do with parentage. That is correct. Begot, begot, begot. You know that from your King James. It's a family tree word. It means to squire or to father. Okay? So to beget someone is, in human beings, it is a sexual term about the, the act of planting the seed in the woman. Okay? So that becomes a baby. So begetting, naturally enough, Arius points out, is something that starts a life. When you beget something, you bring it into existence. It goes from non-existence into existence. See, heresy is always easier. And the easy way, the natural way that a, that a human being is going to understand begetting is going to mean, well, what that means is that I, I don't. there's no mother involved, but somehow he became father and son became son because he brought him into existence. Duh, it's obvious. And then his other big one is uh, second, uh, not second, uh, Colossians 2.15, that he is the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn, you're getting into begetting again. And begetting means you make a zygote and you make an embryo and then you have a child and it comes to life. Boom, That's, there you go. That's begetting. We all know that. And the firstborn means he's born. He comes into existence. Do you see how Arius is looking at the Bible? And you can't just say, well, let's just go back to the Bible. It'll be simple. No, you have to have an understanding of what you're dealing with. Right? And the thing is, there's tons of places where Jesus claims divinity, like the I am statements in John, right? And he says, before Abraham was, I am. Well, he's only 30 years old. It can't be his bodies, you know. And yet, that doesn't solve it either because Arius would say, well, it's not that he's not a god. He's just not eternal god. So, okay, what are they supposed to do with this? You know, the, now, when this comes together, what happens? Remember, Constantine has become emperor, and this controversy is starting to cause riots. You know, people who are Trinitarian are hearing this, and it's spreading from city to city, and they hear it, and they're like, no! Because that means Jesus could change and I could go to hell. No, that's not okay. You can't say that. We have to say that because that's what the Bible says. No, it doesn't. How many places do you see the Trinity? I mean, think about it. He said to go and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And look at the beginning of 1 Thessalonians. You've got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look at his baptism. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, 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 you have all that. But Jesus was created. No! And you have the riot getting going, right? Well, you know, he's just, from Constantine's perspective, I've just settled the empire. And I threw in with you people, and now you're going crazy. Okay, we're going to get together, and we're going to get this settled. And so you had a gathering in a city called Nicaea. Right? This is the first, the very first time since Acts 15 that a large gathering of Christian leaders has happened. Why would that be? Yeah, if you all gather together in one place, the Romans would go, thank you very much, we'll just kill you all. So you've got all these people, and some of them have seen each other because they've traveled from this church to that church to say, what scriptures are you using? You know, they've done that. So I know that guy, and that guy knows that guy, but I've never met that guy, right? Right? And they've never seen each other. And you get this huge gathering together of like 315 people who are all church leaders all over the place. And it was this wonderful experience of, oh my goodness, we really have spread throughout the empire. Look at what we represent. Look at what God has done. And there was this wonderful feeling of, yay, nothing bad can ever happen. Kumbaya, this is great. And they had a few things to deal with. They were mostly minor things like, okay, well, how do we, 
How do you do the Lord's Supper? Well, we do it this way. Okay, well, we're doing it this way, but all right, all right we can hammer that out. And they were minor things. I mean, that's not a minor thing, but, but in terms of controversy, they weren't. And they didn't actually think there was going to, they thought, we're going to solve this. Look how happy we are. This is going to be fine. guy named uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia, not Eusebius the historian, that was Eusebius of Alexandria, but Eusebius Media gets up, and he's, he's got a seat in the council because he's one of the bishops, and he is there to represent Arius because Arius is a presbyter, and he doesn't get a say in this meeting, right? But he gets up, and he is just so confident. All of them are confident. In this room, there are like about a dozen people that supported Arius and that were really firmly for Arius. There were about 20 people who knew what the stakes were here, that knew that they we're going to deny the Trinity and make Jesus just a creature. That's not okay. And then there was everybody else who was like, I don't really care. Can you guys just get along? You know, this doesn't really matter. All that Does it matter? It doesn't matter. Well, Eusebius got up, and he knew he's going to win over all of these people and basically run the 20 off. That's, he knew he was going to do it because it was so obvious from the Scriptures. It was the straightforward reading of the Bible. So he gets up and says, okay, so Jesus is a created being, and he begins to read through his, his manuscript gets about a third of the way through, or at least historians think it was about a third of the way through, because the manuscript was destroyed on the spot. <laughs> the response from the unwashed, not the people who had a committee, a commission, or a, a commitment, get there eventually, not these folks, but all these folks, was, no! And you lie and blasphemy! And there's this it started almost a riot at the Nicene Council. They come charging up to him, and they grab the document off the podium. They throw it on the ground and stomp on it. They take turns stomping on it. Someone's got to withhold Eusebius over here. You know, they got to hold him back. And then they pick it up, they shred it, and they throw it into the fire, and they throw the fire into the river. <laughs> They're like, no, that's not. So now what do they do? Because they've heard what it is not. And they know, okay, what we believe is not that. So what then do we believe? We'll have to pick up with that next week. <laughs> so you'll, you'll have to come again. <laughs> Sorry. That's right. The rocket man's car just went off the cliff. I'm so Sorry. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly correct. Well, I can do a refresher. <laughs> All right. Let's get ready to worship our God. We're out of time. <laughs>